to uh, encourage you to open up your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We'll be spending our time in that text this morning. While you're turning there, uh, I want to spend just a few moments getting on the scene there, setting the stage uh, to, to understand what is surrounding Paul's remarks, specifically what we're going to look at this morning. He begins in chapter 8 uh, addressing this issue of, of Christian liberty. Uh, by the time we get to chapter 9, he then turns to his own uh, use, uh, approach to the Christian liberties that he has. When he gets towards the end of the chapter, about verse 24 of uh, chapter 9, uh, then he's going to go to uh, this issue of self-discipline, self-control. And I don't think it's any secret that with liberty, there must be self-control, self-discipline. You'll notice the first word in chapter 10 is therefore. It connects the previous thought of self-discipline and self-control. Again, particularly when it comes to Christian liberties. Now he's going to begin illustrating, and really verses 1 through uh, 10 are uh, introductory, if you will. Excuse me, verses 1 through 12, uh, 1 through 11. And then 12 and 13 really drive home his point as to what he's going to to say and what it is that he wants these Corinthian brethren to see. But I want us to notice in this uh, these first 11 introductory verses the parallels that he lays out here. Let's begin first of all uh, just reading those and then I want to go back and look at the case that he is building here. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 beginning at verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in their wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also crave. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. I'm going to stop there. What is the parallel that Paul is laying out here? Well, I love the way that he puts this. Verse 1, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. What is the picture that he is painting here? Well, of course, this is obviously the incident there at the Red Sea. What was the situation, the circumstances of Israel previous to that? Enslaved, obviously, there to Pharaoh in Egypt. And Moses takes that defining moment from slavery to freedom, that crossing through the Red Sea, and refers to it as a type of immersion. And I think you get the picture there. They were covered. They were immersed. They were baptized. They had the seas split open. The walls of the sea were on each side of them. The bottom of the sea below them. And then above them, that cloud. That, of course, represented, uh, or Paul is, is using that, showing as a type of immersion. What happened at that point in time? Well, that's when their status changed. They were a people under bondage, under slavery. Now they are a people who are brought to freedom. How and through whom? They now share a new relationship with God through Moses. He's their leader. He's their mediator. He is the one who led them out of Egypt and brought them to freedom. He will be their go-between between them and God. The parallel, I think, is obvious. Before you and I were immersed into Christ, we were enslaved into the slavery of sin. 
Through that immersion, we now have a new covenant relationship with God through our mediator, our leader, our forerunner, Jesus Christ. And so Paul uses this to show, hey, look at the circumstances of Israel. You're in the very same circumstance, so to speak. Now, he continues on, 3 and 4. Just like our baptism into Christ, what did the baptism into Moses do for ancient Israel? Well, it brought them certain rights and privileges and freedoms, just like with any other freedom. All ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. What is he referring to? Well, obviously, the manna that was provided for them there in the wilderness. That spiritual rock, it's not spiritual because of its nature or its origin. It's, it's, it's um, spiritual because of its source. No ordinary rock in the wilderness would produce water. You know that. I know that. But this rock did. Why? Because God made it do so. Or here specifically, Paul refers to Christ. The pre-incarnate Christ was with Israel there providing those things. What's the parallel for you and me today? Christ also provides what we need uh, spiritually to bring us to our uh, home, spiritual maturity. And so the parallel, again, I think is, is quite obvious. Israel, you're brought into a new covenant relationship. You were baptized. You enjoyed certain rights and privileges associated with being free, associated with having a new relationship with God through Moses. <coughs> But, and before we move on to the next verse, I want to stop just a minute and notice the co contrast here. Notice uh, one, two, three, four times. I thought it was five. One, two, three, four. It is four. In the first four verses there, all passed through the sea. All were baptized. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. But what happens when we get to verse five? Did you, did you notice the contrast? Nevertheless with most of them. So we go from all, 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 now to most of them. What happened? Well, let's put this in our terms, the way that we think this day and age. We're in a sports-saturated society. Let's say you could join some team, whatever game or sport of your choice, whatever that may be, and all you had to do was join the team, play by the rules, and you win. If it's football, it's the Super Bowl. If it's baseball, it's the World Series. Pick whatever it is. Stanley Cup if you're a hockey fan. All you got to do is join the team and play by the rules and you win. Victory is yours. That's all you got to do. What happened with Israel? They were on the team, weren't they? But they did not play by the rules once they crossed that Red Sea, did they? No, God was not well pleased. Well, what is it that Paul provides that substantiates that fact? Well, verse 5. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. <laughs> Literally, they're strewn across. If you could go back in time and rent a helicopter and hover over that entire Sinaitic Peninsula, you would see bodies scattered across like a farmer sowing seed. But something's not right. Wait a minute. What did you just say about these people, Paul? They were baptized in the cloud and in the sea. All ate the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. They received blessings associated with that immersion. But something happened between joining the team and reaching victory. What is that missing element? They didn't play by the rules. Corinth, what's going on there? You're part of the team. You're immersed into Christ. You're wearing His name. You're not playing by the rules. What was going on in Corinth? Goodness gracious. They had all kinds of misconceived ideas. Chapter 3, they're wanting to pick out, hold up individual uh, preachers and those who brought them the gospel. Um, chapter 5, the incestuous relationship that the church is turning its eye on. Chapter 6, brothers taking brother to court. Chapter 7, um, 
they're trying to wiggle their way out of, of marriages um, and justify their new relationship into Christ to do that. Uh, what else? Chapter 11, abusing the Lord's Supper. Chapter 15, they've reached the point to say, well, there's no such thing as a resurrection. For crying out loud, can you think of a people more in need of self-control? What's going on in Corinth? They're not playing by the rules. They've allowed this new relationship, this new freedom, all these rights and privileges, and it's just run amok, for lack of a better term. And they've ran wild with all these rights and all these privileges. I don't think it's either any secret that our nation is run amok with all of our rights and privileges and freedoms that we enjoy. Appreciation for those rights. Appreciation for the cost that it took to get us there. The millions of gallons of blood that was shed so that we could uh, enjoy that and appreciate it is not even thought about anymore. And unfortunately, that thinking is leaching its way into the Lord's body. Now, let's continue on. Paul's going to list four examples here in this. Remember, we're still in the introductory part here to show what exactly was going on in Israel that parallels the situation there at Corinth. Four examples here, beginning at verse 6. God wasn't well pleased. The fact that they were laid low in the wilderness proves that. Now he's going to provide four examples. Do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. What's he talking about here? Sinai. What happened at Sinai? They got the golden calf. Hey, Moses, um, he ought to have been down by now. He's not. So let's come up with some brilliant idea. Let's build a golden calf. What is wrong with these people? You just saw ten amazing plagues there in Egypt by the hand of God. You just crossed the Red Sea. Hello? And then now Moses isn't coming down off the mountain as quick as you think he should. So, hey, let's just get a bunch of jewelry together, melt it down, and build an idol, and, and we'll worship that. Israel, you're not playing by the rules. Verse 7, uh, or excuse me, verse 8. Do not, uh, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day. Uh, what is that number? I think 23-ish, 25 uh, God's people were playing the harlot with the daughters of Moab. And don't get all bent out of shape about that missing thousand. Paul here in verse 7, or excuse me, verse 8 refers to 23,000. Moses 24. Very plausible and easy explanation to that is that Moses rounded up, Paul rounded down. What happened there, Israel? You're on the team. You're not playing by the rules. Verse 9, nor let us try the Lord, as some of them did, and were destroyed by the serpents. Perhaps a little better translation of this would be, nor let us keep trying the Lord. This is in the present subjective. So Paul is saying here, he's, this is more than just a reference to ancient Israel. He's talking about and to Corinth. Guys, you're testing the Lord. You're trying Him. You, you keep seeing... How much more can I do? How much more can I get away with? And of course, um, with, with Israel, it was their groaning and complaining about the bread that God had provided them. And you know that deal. Um, God sent those fiery servants among them. With Corinth, their involvement in the pagan temple worship and all that was associated with there, it's, it, it's, it's like, let's just see if we can get away with a little more and a little more and a little more. Teachers, we got some teachers in here. What do you experience those first few days or maybe the week of school every year? I'll bet you anything. What are those new students doing? What are those returning students doing? Does one warning this year really mean one warning? Let me see if I can push it just a little more. Does no talking really mean no talking? What are they doing? They're putting you to the test. Does no really mean no? Well, I have no way of learning unless I push that limit. And that's exactly the picture that Paul is painting here. 
Guys, you're pushing God to a point, and it's not good. Now, there is a reason that all these ugly and black marks of Israel's ancient history were recorded. And here it is. Verse 10. Uh, Nor grumble as some of them did. I skipped that one. Uh, and were destroyed by the destroyer. Uh, what's going on with Israel then? Man, how long was it, or how soon was it, I should say, before they began to play the self-pitying victims? Oh, poor me. Woe is me. Like those guys singing that song on Hee Haw. Gloom, despair. Look at what all you've enjoyed just from being God's covenant people. And now that things aren't going as they should, you're going to start playing this, this woe is me life and, and acting all that out? No. So here's the example. Here's the pattern. Verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example and they were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Now notice I skipped verse 6 intentionally. I want us to go back and look at that because here's two times he mentions this thing of an example of a pattern. Verse 6, now these things happen as examples for us. You notice he did not say that here in verse 11. So let's back up and see why it is that he words these differently on these two separate occasions. Well, verse 6, now these things happen as examples for us so that anytime you see those two words, the writer is, is, uh, is fixing to state a purpose clause. What's the purpose, Paul? So that we would not crave evil things. I love the word that he chooses here to, to use for uh, example. An example or a, a, a pattern. You know what a pattern is, girls, if you sew... You, you, you take something, or if you, you're drawing something, that might be a little better illustration there. What do you do? You take that picture, and you lay it down, and then you take your other piece of paper and put on top of it, and you trace out the lines. If you do the same thing, and you make the same curves and moves and lines with your pencil, then you get the same picture, right? That's pretty straightforward, pretty common sense. Why does Paul say that in verse 6? Why does he choose to employ the term that he does that we have rendered a pattern or example? Because they are doing the same thing. So if I make the same lines and same curves that's on the other paper, then I get the same picture. Corinthians, Christians today, if you do the same thing that ancient Israel did, you're going to end up with what Israel got. You're following the lines. You're immersed into a new relationship with God. But you're not playing by the rules. The point in verse 11, just because Israel was immersed and brought into freedom did not ensure them of victory. Corinth. Why does he word that differently in verse 11? Because the example continues. Verse 6, he said that this example is for us. Verse 11, he does not. What does he say instead? These things happened to them as an example, and they were written for our instruction. This is the way that we should operate today, upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Corinth, Christians today, you're in a better position than ancient Israel was. We have the full will of God revealed. We have Israel's history that we can look back upon. Nothing has changed between God and His people. When they got to Sinai, instead of being mindful of the ethical, theological restraints, the sober-minded self-control, they exhibited just the opposite. Corinth, when you were immersed into Christ and you were surrounded there in your city by all those pagan temples, instead of honoring the ethical and theological restraints that is expected of God's people, the sober-minded self-control, you threw it out the window and thus we have all the problems we see there listed in that entire book and then the second book as, as well. What is Paul trying to get across to them? You're tracing the same lines out. You're drawing the same picture 
you're going to get the same thing that they got. Well, this is just too hard, too difficult. All this temptation surrounding me here at Corinth, all these uh, pagan temples, all that is there and present there when we get to, to Sinai and all that's going around with, with God's own people. I mean, I'm free, aren't I? I'm enjoying liberty. I'm enjoying a new relationship with God. That should be enough, shouldn't it? Absolutely not. And so now Paul's point or his conclusion in verses 11 and 12, or 12 and 13. I've got that mixed up all morning. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed. Yes, you're on the team. It's a wonderful thing. But you have not obtained victory yet. And you will not obtain victory unless you play by the rules. But this journey between point A and point B, between life and death, is too difficult. It's too hard for me. There's too many tests and trials and temptations and all that's it's mixed up in, in this thing that we call life. How is it that I can go through and um, exercise self-control? Well, here I think is perhaps one of the most reassuring, comforting verses, statements, facts, whatever you want to call it in our Bible. And in it, Paul issues three facts. I'm going to call them. If you want to call them promises, call them promises. Three facts that I have got to remember every time temptation comes my way. Verse 13. First of all, no temptation that I face is unique to me. No temptation has overtaken you but such as is common to man. <laughs> Folks, how easy, how easy is it when I want to do things Eric's way that I begin to justify. Nobody else has been in my shoes. Nobody else is facing the situation that I'm facing right now. I can't reconcile that with this verse, can I? Because Paul says right here, just as plain as black and white, no temptation has taken, overtaken you, Eric, but such as is common to man. Don't look at this and say you're in a unique situation. Don't you dare look at this situation in your life and say that nobody else has, has been faced with what I'm being faced with right now, today, right here. Because it isn't so. So that excuse is gone out the window, isn't it? Second promise, second fact. But God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Fact number two. God has led me in this situation or I have found myself in this situation or however it is that I want to put it that there's no way out but to succumb to this temptation. I can't reconcile that with black and white scripture, can I? Because here it is, black and white. Eric, God has said he will not ever ever allow you to be put into a situation where you are tempted, so tempted that that temptation is beyond what your strength is able to endure. You know what that tells me, guys? That with every temptation, every possible sin that's out there, God knows exactly where my breaking point is. And this text tells me that He will not allow me to be in a situation that is beyond that. So whatever the temptation might be, if, it, if, it's, if it's pornography, it's right here. There's Eric's breaking line. God will never, ever allow me to be put in a situation where it's right here. Maybe it's lying. God knows that Eric's breaking point is right here. He will never, ever allow me to be put in a situation where the temptation is right here. Do you get it? Guys, I think this is one of the most reassuring statements in our Bible. And then the third, fact, promise. But also, with the temptation, will provide a way of escape. What did I say a minute ago about purpose clauses? Pay attention to them. So that you will be able to endure it. Literally bear under. We've all carried something heavy before. Maybe it was so heavy that we didn't get to the point where we were wanting to get and so we just dumped it off. 
That's not this word. This word is literally being able to bear, to carry, uh, to bear under that load until you reach your destination. So fact number three, God, I'm in this situation. I'm being tempted. There's absolutely no way out. I can't reconcile that with black and white scripture, can I? So, Eric, don't use that excuse. That dog won't hunt. Here it is in black and white. I think there are really two ways of receiving what Paul has said here in verse 13. You might think of one as a little more negative. We've kind of touched on that. And that is the fact that I'm just flat out, black and white, out of excuses. I can't say I'm in a unique situation. I can't say that God has uh, allowed me to be in a situation that's beyond my ability to uh, endure that temptation. And I can't say that I never found a way out. There is a way out. I've got to find it. It might mean a host of things. It might mean that I have to get rid of that computer or that iPhone, whatever it is that, that's leading you or uh, uh, facilitating your addiction to pornography. It might be that you just have to take the thing back and get a regular phone and not have a smartphone anymore. I promise you, life will go on just fine. It may be that you need to break a friendship that, for whatever reason, leads you into this sin or that. Maybe it's gossip. Maybe it's cursing. Maybe it's lying. Whatever it is. There is a way out. It's not always easy. It's not always pleasant. I can assure you, Satan's going to make sure that's, that's going to hurt. He's going to make sure that it's not appealing. He's going to make sure that it's so much easier to stay in this situation or that, whatever it is. But there is a way out. Eric, are you willing to exercise self-control to find and take that way out. The second way of looking at this is maybe a bit more positive. And I think perhaps a healthy view would to, to see it through both lenses. One as the fact that, hey, I can't turn to this and use it as excuses, but through the other lens, I see a lot of hope. I see three promises here that tell me that if I join the team, and I play by the rules, and I keep these three facts in mind no matter how hard life gets, that I can go through on the other side and endure temptation a better, a stronger person. In fact, the illustration there that Paul uses in the last few verses of chapter 9 have to do with an athlete running, boxing. How does an athlete get to the point to where he can run a 5K? How does a football player get to where he can lift whatever it is a football player can lift? 200 pounds, I don't know, 500 pounds. Every aspect of life in which we grow takes testing. Whether it's athletics, whether it's spiritual growth, whether education. Yeah. How is it that you grow and you're not the same person today that you were yesterday? Because... I took a test yesterday and I came across it on the other side stronger and better. I usually lift 200 pounds, but today I lifted 225. I usually run 5K, and I don't even know what that is. So today I ran 6K. Bit by bit, we have to be tested. Otherwise, we are still the young, weak, spiritual, immature babes in Christ that we were before we even got dried off. Now what is the difference between testing and temptation? We won't go there. Um, James talks about that in James chapter 1, oh about verse 12 or so. Testing is a natural part of life. Again, everything that I do that's, that's worthy of my time and attention I have to be tested at so that tomorrow I can come across a stronger, a better person. Athletics, education, whatever it is. But James makes it very clear that that transition from testing to temptation is made when I am drawn away 
by my own lust. Well, just think about it. A test in school. Eric, you either know the material or you don't. Just answer the questions and turn in the paper. That's a test. It's made, given to, to make me stronger, to make me smarter. But as I'm sitting down, I didn't study, and I realized that. So I'm drawn away, in the words of James, by my own lust. I want to make a hundred on this thing, even though I didn't study for the material. So now the test has become a temptation. An opportunity to sin now presents itself. And so what do I do? I listen to the spiritual side of me that says just answer the test and turn it in. The physical side that says make a hundred on it even though it's not honest, even though you didn't study and ingest the material. And so now look at the doors that have opened up because my own lust, I've been allowed to be drawn away by my own lust from a test to a temptation. Now I'm cheating. Now I'm stealing a diploma or a degree that I didn't earn. That's the difference between a test and temptation. Guys, I can guarantee you if we will be mindful of these three things whenever temptation rears its ugly head that you can endure it. Because you have a God who wants you to endure it. And He has set forth three facts, three undeniable facts here that whenever I am right at that breaking point, I've got to come face to face with. Eric, this is not a unique temptation. Somewhere, some way, along the way, well, I don't know what there have been, billions upon trillions of people who've walked this globe. Somebody's been in your situation, Eric. Number two, God is not allowing you to be put in a level that is beyond your ability to bear that temptation. And number three, there's a way out. Get your head out of the clouds, out of the doom and gloom, and look for it and take it. You know, it's entirely possible that you've been debating doing what you know you need to do. It's not hard, not difficult to understand. You know you need to be immersed in the Christ. You know that right now you are enslaved to sin and it has got you by the throat. But you've been unwilling to make that step because you're afraid that once I get to the other side that I won't be the person that I need to be perfectly. Because I can't bear temptation. I can't endure it. I might give in to this temptation or that. See, folks, here's three undeniable facts that you cannot dispute. You can get through on the other side. Why would you want to leave this morning not being immersed in the Christ, knowing that all you've got to do is join the team, play by the rules, and victory is yours. It's a done deal. It's in the bank. Or maybe you are a Christian, you have been immersed in the Christ, and looking back, you realize that I really haven't been playing by the rules. I haven't been taking that way out that God has supplied. I keep telling myself that this temptation is too much for me, it's more than I can handle, and so I uh, fool myself into succumbing into that temptation. And I rationalize and justify my behavior because after all, Nobody else has it as bad as me. Nobody else is in the same situation that Eric is in. What need is it that we can help you with this morning? We have people, we have shepherds who would love to wrap their arms around you to pray with, pray for you. What need can we help you address this morning? Let us know while we stand and sing.